Teresa. Hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm going to start off with a story. And it begins, as all good stories do, on Amtrak. So it was the end of 2016, and I was traveling from Boston to New York. I just spent Christmas with my partner's family, and we were all still just processing the results of the November election. One of my good friends told me that I should pick a cause that I care deeply about and support it in a way that only I could. So I thought back to one of my childhood heroes, Rita Levi Montalcini, who discovered nerve growth factor in the 1940s. Her initial discovery wasn't at the University of Turin, but actually in a makeshift laboratory she'd set up in her bedroom after Mussolini had barred Jewish people from working in academic settings. I knew there were other women like her who had made significant improvements to their fields, but I was drawing a blank. The only other name that came to mind was a legendary scientist, Marie Curie. So I started Beyond Curie, a series of illustrations and stories that celebrates the rich history of women kicking ass in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Women like Maria Mirzakhani and Mary Golda Ross. I started it so that young women everywhere could stop wondering if they had the potential to make an impact in STEM and instead start asking, why should we stop now? The project was funded by a Kickstarter campaign, which attracted hundreds of backers, parents, teachers, engineers, and scientists who wanted the women in their lives to be inspired by that same legacy. In partnership with the March for Science organizers, I released a special series of posters that anyone could download and print for a rally or protest. And a couple of months later, I headed down to Washington, D.C., along with thousands of others, and we stood huddled under our umbrellas on that wet, dreary day, taking to the streets of the nation's capital to stand up for science. And that's when I saw her, a woman carrying a huge, bedazzled, beyond Curie poster of Rosalind Franklin the scientist who had made crucial contributions to the understanding of DNA's double helix structure. It was the same poster that I had brought with me to the march. She told me that she was getting her PhD and had flown into DC from South Dakota. For her, the poster was a powerful reminder that women belong in the lab just as much as men do. Now, as I've continued to work on Beyond Curie, I've gone deeper and deeper into the lives of these incredible women and their groundbreaking work. How were they able to push through when others weren't? What methods did they use to gain new insights and get their work recognized in a male-dominated field? And how can these lessons be transferred outside of the realm of deep scientific and engineering research into the lives of the rest of us? Today, I want to share with you the stories of four of these women featured in the Beyond Curie series, exploring how their work unfolded and a little bit more about their personalities. This first lesson is about what to do when you have a truly groundbreaking idea. We live in an era where innovators have brought brilliant and sometimes devastating inventions and breakthroughs into the world, but not all ideas are immediately ready for the limelight. So what do you do? If you bury it, are you giving up? No one wants to be a quitter, but if you push for it as a lone voice in the wild, you might just get cast out and ignored, which means your work never gets the impact it deserves. This is a story of staying in the game. Barbara McClintock was born in 1902. She spent most of her childhood in Brooklyn, and her parents early on noted her solitary and independent streak, discarding the name Eleanor, the name they had initially intended on giving her as, as being too delicate and feminine. She found her love for science in high school and was accepted later into Cornell's College of Agriculture, where she earned a bachelor's and then a PhD in botany, focusing on maize. That's the grain with the multicolored kernels, also known as Indian corn. So after postdocs at Caltech and the University of Missouri, where she made crucial contributions to the understanding of genetic replication in maize, she accepted a faculty position at Cold Springs Harbor in 1942. 
And it was there at this leading biomedical facility in upstate New York that she made her groundbreaking discoveries in genetics. Now, it all started with a simple question. Why does maize have differently colored kernels? Some of them are yellow, some of them are purple, sometimes this is weird mosaic pattern. Why is that? The scientific consensus at the time was that uh, genetic replication and genes were ordered in a fixed pattern. So that meant that theoretically, from ear to ear, maize should have similar coloring. So Barbara developed some of these amazing x-ray techniques to induce mutations in cells. And she noticed that different segments of DNA would kind of jump around the chromosomes when this happened. She also noticed that other segments of DNA would turn genes on and off. Her findings led to a theory about the uneven coloring in maize kernels. So if a piece of DNA was dropped into a segment that coded for purple pigment, it might disrupt that pigmentation and cause a mosaic kernel. If it was dropped into a segment that turned genes on and off, it might result in a non-pigmented yellow kernel. McClintock was a highly respected scientist, and her peers in botany appreciated the work that she was doing. But other scientists, they thought she was crazy. They responded with puzzlement and even hostility, as she described it. She gave a big talk in 1951, summarizing a paper that she had written for a major symposium. The room goes dead silent. Talk about a tough crowd. But it didn't bother her too much. She said, she said, it didn't bother me that much because when you know you're right, you know that sooner or later, it'll come out in the wash. So she continues to publish her work on maize, but after years and years and years of resistance, she starts moving on to other areas. She does seminal work on evolutionary pathways of maize, and she travels to Central and South America to do this work. At the same time, the field of genetics moves forward. Other scientists start to see this jumping gene phenomenon in bacteria and yeast also advances in technology improve. So now they're able to understand exactly what's happening. They realize that McClintock's weird corn breeding research is actually fundamental ge to genetics. And it's really a foundation for all of these other fields and has implications for every biomedical field. She's the first person to win the MacArthur Genius Grant the first woman to receive the National Medal of Science. And finally, after over 30 years, she's given the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. She is the first American woman to win an unshared Nobel Prize in any category. She also gets a building named after her at Cold Spring Harbor, which is cool too. <laughs> so, McClintock isn't the only one who had to wait years to get her work recognized. In 2017, the Me Too movement brought down Harvey Weinstein and reverberated across the country and around the world, irreversibly changing the conversation around sexual harassment. But its origins began more than a decade earlier with the work of social activist and community organizer, Tarana Burke. Born in the Bronx to a low-income household, she experienced sexual violence as a girl and young woman. In 2003, she started a nonprofit called Just Be that developed programming for young black girls and teens to succeed socially and professionally. She first used the phrase, Me Too, on MySpace as part of a campaign to promote empowerment through empathy among survivors of sexual abuse. This campaign became so important to her that in 2008, she renamed her nonprofit, Me Too. She continued this community work traveling to Brooklyn and Selma. And then on October 15th, 2017, 
Alyssa Milano posted on Twitter about Me Too for the first time, and it received 24,000 retweets and set off a tidal wave that continues to this day. Later on, Milano followed up that tweet crediting Burke with her earlier use of the phrase and her longstanding efforts to support survivors of sexual abuse. Toronto Burke went on to be named one of Time Magazine's Silence Breakers, which Time Magazine named 2017 Person of the Year. And she was this year's commencement speaker at UPenn's School of Social Policy and Practice. McClintock's and Burke's stories, they share parallels, including their initial rise in the field. Burke's early mates work, excuse me, McClintock's early mates work was considered first rate, and Burke had started her community activism as a young girl and continued it wherever she went. They also both had a breakthrough idea. For McClintock, it was that genetic regulation could be controlled. For Burke, it was that one of the ways to help survivors heal and communicate the awful prevalence of sexual abuse is to share one's own story. And for both of them, it took years of working on other things, putting their initial idea aside, and waiting until the world was ready for them to get the recognition they deserved. It takes some time for ideas to permeate the world. And yeah, it probably was much harder for them because they were women. But by making their mark and staying in the game, their fields were able to recognize the importance of their contributions. The next lesson that I think we can learn from leading scientists is that the world needs more champions. Women are often given the advice, go find a mentor, someone who's uh, had some more years on you in the field and can offer advice or approaches to your work. But having a mentor isn't enough. Women and ambitious people of every stripe need champions. And the surest way to understand the difference between a mentor and a champion is to look at Elizabeth Blackburn and Carol Greider. So in the late 1970s and early 80s, the field of molecular biology was brimming with excitement. There were lots of advances being made, including the discovery of telomeres which are repeating segments at the ends of chromosomes that essentially protect them and keep them from injecting bad or erroneous DNA during replication. So Elizabeth Blackburn was a postdoc at the time. She was doing early work on telomeres, actually studying pond scum because it was cheap and readily available and because uh, cellular replication is generally highly conserved, which means it's the same in pond scum and mammals and plants and even humans. So she sets up her lab at UC Berkeley and in 1983 she recruits a young University of San Diego biology major, major named Carol Greider. So Greider had done great in undergrad. She was already an accomplished researcher in her own right and knew her way around the lab, but she suffered from dyslexia, which meant she didn't really test well. So when it came time to interview for her PhD programs, she only got offers at two places to interview, and one of them was UC Berkeley. After meeting with the team, she said, you know what, this seems like a great place to do research and a great group of people to work with. She was all in. She worked 12 hour days in the lab, learned all different kinds of techniques on the fly, and engaged in a lot of intense intellectual discussion with Blackburn. The duo hypothesized that there was some kind of enzyme, a protein probably, that would regulate this cellular replication and control telomeres. Finally, after many, many tests, around Christmas time, Carol comes rushing in with the results of an experiment that show an enzyme that could potentially be the one that they had hypothesized. Blackburn remembers this exact moment and thinking, wow, this is something big. So eventually, Carol moves on. She gets her PhD, 
goes on to teach at Cold Springs Harbor and then gets a faculty position at Johns Hopkins where she still does research and teaches today. Then in 2009, she, Blackburn, and a third scientist who had worked on the early work of telomeres won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. Blackburn wasn't a mentor for Greider. She was her champion. She pushed Greider. She made sure that they connected on a daily basis. This is uncommon in grad programs. Usually, principal investigators touch base with their graduate students maybe once a month. Blackburn also made sure that Carol got credit for the discovery that she made, even though she was only one year out of undergrad and a very young researcher, something that Jocelyn Bell Burnell never got from her principal investigator. Jocelyn discovered the first pulsars, but instead of sharing credit, her principal investigator took the credit. So the lesson is to find champions and be a champion for others when you can. But easier said than done, right? Wouldn't we all love to have a brilliant, influential, encouraging leader who is helping us do highly visible and impactful work, of course. But how does this actually happen in practice? One of the best examples is from the Obama administration. A couple years ago, the Washington Post did a piece on Obama's first term when two thirds of his aides were men. So women had to elbow their way to get into meetings and when they were there, they were talked over and ignored. So the women got together and developed something called amplification, where when a woman made a key point, other women would repeat it and then give that woman credit. This had the dual impact of making sure that their ideas and their voices were heard, but also it made sure that the men couldn't take credit for their ideas. And it worked. We saw Obama calling more and more directly on the women in those meetings. Now, my last story comes from Asia, which is fitting because I owe the opportunity to give this talk to the Asian Google network. UU2 is a Chinese pharmaceutical chemist who led a team that developed a breakthrough cure for tropical malaria, for which she won the Nobel Prize in 2015. UU2 grew up in Ningbo, which is about 120 miles south of Shanghai. And as a young child, she developed a serious case of tuberculosis, which actually inspired, to go, inspired her to go into medical research. Now, she studied at the Beijing University uh, School of Pharmacology and graduated in 1955. A couple years later, in 1960, the North Vietnamese leader Ho Chi Minh appealed to his friend and ally, the Chinese premier, for help. North Vietnamese soldiers were dropping like flies from tropical malaria, and the current cure, chloroquine, was ineffective. It just so happened that in southern China, lots of citizens were dying from malaria as well, so the Chinese premier asked Mao Zedong to set up a secret government program called Project 523 to discover a cure. It's not really that original of a name since it's after the date of its founding, May 23rd, 1967. Regardless, they recruited 500 scientists from all over the country, different labs and institutions to participate in the fight against malaria. UU2 joins in 1969. She actually had to put her young daughter in a nursery as she traveled to southern China to investigate what was going on. So around the world, other scientists are getting involved. They've tested over 240,000 different compounds for a cure to no avail. So UU2 decides to retread some old ground 
and go back and look at traditional Chinese medicine. She travels around the country talking to different Chinese medicine practitioners, compiling all of her notes and all of this research in a big notebook. By early 1971, she and her team had tested over 2,000 recipes from Chinese medicine, had extracted about 380 herbal extracts from 200 herbs, and tested it on mice. Then they found out that there was one compound from the sweet wormwood plant that seemed like it might be a contender. This compound was known to help with intermittent fevers, which is characteristic of malaria. And also, it proved to inhibit parasite growth. So after testing it on mice, Yu Yu Tu steps forward as the very first human test subject. She actually tested it on herself, which is incredible. Fortunately, it's safe for humans. It works. Patient trials continue, which prove highly successful. But no one in the world knows about this research because of the Cultural Revolution and because this is a highly secret military project. But once these international relations reopens, UU2 is asked to present the findings of Project 523 to the World Health Organization. After that, more folks start to use artemisinin, which is what they ended up calling this compound. And it's one of the frontline tools against malaria. So between 2000 and 2012, the global incidence of malaria drops 25%, and the global mortality rate for malaria drops 42%. In a recent estimate, it said that her discovery of artemisinin has saved hundreds of millions of lives. Pretty incredible, right? So another woman who's not so afraid to retread old ground to discover new insights is former GE Vice Chair Beth Comstock. Now, Comstock started her career at NBC News as a journalist in Washington, DC. A couple of years later, she gets the opportunity to travel to New York for new job opportunities. Despite having a small child and being a single parent, she takes the leap. And this move to the big city pays off. She gets opportunities at CNN and then at CBS, running East Coast PR for the classiest network in the country. Then in 1993, she gets a call to return back to NBC. They have an opening for the vice president of media relations. But the problem is, is that recently NBC just got outed for running a fake news story. Morale was in the toilet. Resistance to her taking this job, even considering it, started immediately after she got the call. But she knew that in her gut, this was the job for her to take. Something was calling Comstock back to NBC. And she ended up following her gut and being correct. They gave her a lot of latitude. She was able to experiment and try new things. And two years later, she launched MSNBC with, hack of, with the help of Jack Welsh and Bill Gates. And it's now the second most watched channel on cable news. Learning to retread old ground to find new insights. It's a lesson that I use myself in developing Beyond Curie. I would never have known that my fourth grade book report on Rita Levi Montalcini would be the spark for a project that would have such a global response, lead to a main stage TED talk, and also lead to a whole highway tunnel dedicated to women in STEM. In fact, I didn't even think I'd still be working on Beyond Curie, but I'm glad that I am. Beyond Curie is about discovering our heroes. Because when we're able to connect with greatness, we come to see that it is not some distant, unreachable place, but a long body of work forged through perseverance, love, and courage. Because when we truly know our past, we can reclaim our present. And when we hold the present in our hands, the future is ours to shape. Thanks so much for listening.
I guess we can open up to questions. I noticed you made multiple references to Cold Springs Harbor. Was that coincidence or did you, was there some reason for that? Well, it's a leading biomedical institution, so a lot of people who have won the Nobel Prize did work there. But uh, I guess in this talk, purely by coincidence. Um, could you uh, talk more about the format of this project beyond Curie and, you know, sure. how, how can girls and women access it and connect to these messages that Absolutely. you're trying to convey? Uh, so it lives online at beyondcurie.com. We do a lot of exhibits around the country and around the world that shows these portraits, gives a small little description of what these scientists and technologists have contributed to the world. And also there's an AR app in the Apple and Android store. Thank you. Sure. Oh, there's also a Kickstarter that we're running right now. Uh, that's holiday cards in case you're interested in sharing these women for the holidays. Um, have you considered working with schools or are you working with schools around the country, you know, to encourage, um, you know, girls ma being made aware of, and girls and boys, really? That's, that's a great idea. We are working with several schools. Um, it's kind of come about organically. Um, we field a lot of inbound from schools and we donate a lot of sets of these posters and um, little wall decals for schools. Uh, but if you have other suggestions, I'm definitely open. Thank you. Sure. Um, can you share a little more about your own journey from like being a neuroscientist to coming up with these works of art and like how that took off and turned into Beyond Curie as like an organization and everything? Sure. Um, so I realized that I was better at communicating research and communicating science than actually doing the science and I could make more impact there. So I got my MFA at Pratt and after that I bounced around different art director and creative director positions and then I got the opportunity to do something called the TED Residency which is an incubator program where you have some sort of idea worth spreading that you apply with. Mine was that design can shine a light on breakthroughs happening in science. And I actually incubated another project, not Beyond Curie there. It's a program that pairs scientists and designers to co-create works of art and design that translate research. And we put up pop-up exhibits all over the country and work with different institutions. Uh, Beyond Curie started because I was trying to find a way to give back after the election and support causes that I believed in. And supporting women in STEM is one of the ones that I believe in a lot. So I started it as a, a little digital project that I wanted to put online. I thought, you know what, there are so many women that people don't know about, never heard their names before. They've probably heard of their discoveries, but never knew that women made them. So why don't we create a format that's colorful, that's visually appealing so that people's attentions are grabbed and then we can roll the stories into this experience. I did not expect for it to be picked up by Fast Company and a bunch of other different media networks, which is kind of how it grew to a global phenomenon. And I've just been continuing to work on it, adding scientists to it. Um, and we try very hard to go into different countries and work with different institutions to figure out what's a way that we can bring Beyond Curie there. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming.